Uh, colleagues, we've got a terrific panel for you on leadership uh, assembled today. Um, I appreciated personally the invite to reflect uh, on what leadership looks like, particularly leadership that leads to excellence in an academic uh, context. And picking up the last bit of our, our conference theme, I think we've got a really diverse uh, panel for you today, representing quite a wide range of the higher education providers uh, in Australia uh, today. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, briefly introduce ourselves uh, by way of uh, telling a little bit to you about our ideas around what leadership leading to excellence looks like and perhaps a story or two about our own experience of that. Uh, we might have a bit of a discussion in front of you uh, and then, then open out to questions. Uh, so uh, I might start, Joanne, with you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to say is that I don't believe there is a science of leadership. Now that's not to say there won't be one one day or that you can't learn things from other people's experience, but if there was a science of leadership, I wouldn't be here and probably none of these people either. I think you have to find your own style of leadership. Leaderships are di as diverse as almost anything else. But if I look back at my career and I reflect upon it, I think there are possibly four characteristics that helped me, which were then underpinned by two core values. So firstly is um, an ability to tolerate ambiguity and take a risk. The second is an ability to build teams. The third is an ability to be in a team and the uh, fourth is an ability, I think, to be humble. Mm -hmm. The two values are um, trust and an unshakable belief in your core value proposition, which for me is the value of higher education. Now, I do suspect a sense of humor helps, um, but I won't, won't go there. Too dangerous these days. Um, the story that I've chosen to tell you, I think, will illustrate a little bit about taking a risk and a little bit about building teams. And it goes right back to the very start of my career as an academic leader. In 2001, the calendar year 2001, I was in the Northern Territory and I wrote the 10-year strategic plan for the Northern Territory Police, Fire and Emergency Services. By 2002, I was back in my position at the University of London as a senior lecturer, and I was asked by the uh, equivalent of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor to go with him to the Korean Embassy. He said, you know something about Asia and international relations, I want you to come with me. Now, it wasn't going to the Korean Embassy that bothered me in the slightest. It was the train trip with the Deputy Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> what on earth was someone like me going to talk to him about? So I talked about my year in the Northern Territory, and I said, ha, 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 guess what I did? I wrote a strategic plan. Isn't that hilarious? That's not what he heard. What he heard was, my goodness, somebody in the university that knows something about strategic planning, I'd better make her dean. <laughs> so I said, okay. And then the next day I said, what does a dean do? So that's the tolerance of, of, of risk. So I became dean of this faculty. There was a school of business in deficit Who's ever heard of a business school in deficit? <laughs> there was a school of politics that was racked with, well, politics. <laughs> there was a social work department that was led with a bully. <laughs> there was a history department that wanted to leave and join the arts faculty. And there was an economics school that had been on strike and whose head had launched a grievance against the vice chancellor because the Vice-Chancellor had a bigger office. <laughs> right, so I needed to build a team. So I built a team and the important thing here was that I made the head of economics 
my deputy because I knew I needed somebody who thought very differently to me and who would give me a really hard time. So that team was successful enough to enable me to move on. Fantastic. And I think Joanne might have just won on the humour score, but we'll see how we can do. Um, so over to Alison. Uh, oh, well, thanks very much, Joanne. I'm, I'm glad I changed what I'm saying because I agree with everything that you said, particularly the sense of humour, and what a great story. Um, I'm Alison Johnson. I'm the Chief Executive of Advance HE, and, and I'm from England. Perhaps I should say Little England, a little bit embarrassed at the moment listening to the conference today. However, my story, I thought what I'd share with you is my story of merging three organisations into one, because when I looked at the instructions, there was something about leading fast, furious, disruptive times, and it certainly felt like that. There were three agencies, one for leadership, one for teaching, one for equality, and the vice chancellor decided for lots of reasons, not, not least saving money, it would be very good to bring them together. And it took two years to get to the point where the boards voted to do that, and I was appointed chief executive, and we did the merger in seven months. And I can tell you, it was really fast and furious. So I thought I'd share some learning with you. Um, there was no time for textbooks and all that stuff about form follows function. Well, very nice in theory, but I had to restructure and take out 20% cost, staff, non-cost, everything like that. Um, then there's the tyranny, the tyranny of decision making. Every day, a whole host of decisions to make. You don't have all the information. The tyranny of people asking you questions for which you've got no idea what the answer is. And if anybody asked me what my vision was again, I wanted to strangle them, frankly. Uh, but you have to come up with something. What I did learn, though, was that speed actually is good because although it felt unrelentingly fast to me, to the staff, it actually felt quite slow. The other thing I knew I had to absolutely build in was to know what the impact was going to be of what we were doing. Why should anybody come to a new agency if we couldn't demonstrate our impact? So no textbooks to help, really, no time for that. A good piece of advice I got was from somebody, find a book that speaks to you and just use it, because it'll give you comfort, Alison, if nothing else. So I thought, fine. I did that. I found a book. So we came up, I would come up with a set of principles, actually, about leading in those times. Our first mantra, when there is no luxury of time, was the principle of... JFDI, which is just flipping do it, because we haven't got time, and it got a bit more fruity at times, I can assure you. 80% <laughs> um, is good enough. We didn't have time for perfection. 80% had to be good enough in terms of the decisions. And then what you get wrong, and we did get things wrong, put it right quickly, even if it is painful. Then it's all a series of a set of relationships. The relationship with my chair and the board who were all new, getting to know each other, I had to make sure they came every inch of the way, keep them informed, so I had their support. They didn't actually believe it was possible, actually. They only told me that afterwards. So I'm glad they didn't tell me before. Um, the relationship with your stakeholders, and I'm, we're here at the Texa conference, and I'm, and I'm looking at Anthony and the team. You know, they work with a whole mass of stakeholders, and when you're leading change, you've got to keep them on board. Why should people want to carry on being members? It's partly why I'm here as well, because we've got a lot of members here. Very important to keep people share, having a shared understanding of what's going on and that you're still with them. Um, and then relationship with staff. And my learning here was listen to your staff, love your staff. And I'm talking in the sense of agape here, not eros, because that gets you into trouble. But you really got to love them because it's a difficult journey for them and for you. And you have to put up with quite a lot of stuff, but they're more important than you are. Passion, if you're not passionate about it, they can see right through that. Why should they follow you if you're not passionate about you know, a challenging future? Tolerance and forgiveness. It was very difficult, three different cultures, five locations, different languages. Could be all interpreted as trouble and nobody wanted it. I said, nobody wants to do anything wrong on purpose. So tolerance and forgiveness is the way we, we were going to live for this next six months. And then finally, live the values you want to see. And we've spent time developing our values, and our values spell, we can. And that, I think, sums up how we've come together in a very short period of time. We can. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Uh, and third, Sadie. Sadie. Um, so 
As I introduced myself earlier, my name is Sadie Heckenberg and I'm the president of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Postgraduate Association. Um, and once again, pay my respects to the elders past and present who will allow me to speak twice on their country today. Um, I suppose for me, I thought leadership and I thought leadership roles and I thought of other people <laughs> um, because I am, well, I've just graduated, so I, I was still a student um, and I am still quite relatively young, 31. It's, it's still a bit young. Um, and so I was thinking, well, who are my examples of leadership? What is leadership to me, both in the student sector and in Indigenous education, that I can really reflect upon? Um, and I was thinking about it and actually talking to my brother, because that's what I do. Um, and he said, why don't you talk about yourself? And I was like, oh, OK, let's talk about myself. And I think one of the things that I was reflecting upon when I was thinking about that was my organisation. So I took over NATSIPA um, three years ago. I've been on the executive for longer than that. Um, but my organisation is an organisation that's been around quite a long time. It's been around over 20 years. Um, and it's actually had some quite prominent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders in today that were the president at one point in time. But I took over an organisation that had a budget of $500 a year. And so a lot of what you do within that organisation is very much voluntary. It's still voluntary. We don't receive any kind of stipend, even though our budget's a little bit bigger now. But it was how do you have an organisation, how do you reinvent an organisation that's been around for quite a long time, um, but that nobody really knows the name of or has heard of before? And I think one of the things that I really took into to consideration was, OK, well, how do you become face? How do you become visible? How do you build a team that's really passionate about advocacy? And I think one of the things that um, is, is so important to me is that we need to kind of almost be ageless within leadership. To be truly dynamic, to be, to be at the forefront of leadership, we need to not look at somebody and go, oh, you're the age of a leader. Because that doesn't actually get us innovative thinking. Um, it gets us thinking about the past. I think that was really important. Also creating a really good team. And I did just mention that, but having people that are actually committed to the cause, um, I think that making sure that you're on top of all of the different areas that your students or your um, cohort or your faculty, what's really, truly, fundamentally important to them. Because sometimes you can be asked or you can be told, this is what you're going to talk about. But if that's not what's truly, fundamentally important to your, to your cohort, to your staff, to your institution, then that's not going to get anybody anywhere, um, except maybe the person who asked you to address it. Um, and I think that that's something that I've really to take in consideration when I've thought about innovative leadership and when I've thought about, well, how do we as student leaders and how do we as Indigenous academics really break through that almost very thick glass ceiling that there is in, in the education system that really says, well, you're not necessarily educated enough to have a voice, yeah? And so, for me, innovative leadership, for me, my, really, my big take home was don't look anybody at face value and say you don't have experience enough to be in this room because everybody has enough experience to sit in the room and have a voice and have a say. And together, all of our voices actually change our present and improve our future. Great, thank you. And finally, Simon. Yeah, the example I'll give is, is really leadership in action, and I'll just share a story, and it relates to student wellbeing and, uh, and safety. Um, and I think most, and there's the higher education students in the room here, that you, you go to a provider for two reasons. The first is that you've selected them as, as the best, the course that's going to meet your needs, and the qualification that's going to get you to a useful career. That's only part of the equation. The other part is you want to enjoy that social interaction over those number of years. And uh, uh, that doesn't always happen. And I think for providers, what we've done is we've focused on uh, teaching and learning, pedagogy, quilt data, and so forth. And that's uh, very important. But what are we doing in this other important part to enhance a student experience. And I think if we look at society and the community, we're seeing increased drug use, sexual assault, sexual harassment and bullying. Well, that's how it appears. Now, if that is occurring, there's reasonable chance that that's also 
happening on, to some degree on our campuses and certainly in our residential uh, facilities. So a couple of years ago, about four years ago, um, I met on the CEO, the principal, with our student councillor, a head of department and five student leaders. And we workshopped this over a number of days and we came up with three themes. And the first is that there were some physical changes and actions we had to make at our campus to improve the life for students. Uh, there was some support and communication uh, implications or things that we needed to do. And the other one was education. We had to educate ourselves uh, to be better and to provide that experience. So the first one was physical changes. And I know all of us, we've got security cameras, we've got security gates on our, our, our sites. But we developed a policy related around illegal drug use. And all of our students are rural and they're all over 18, average age of 20. So we actually developed the policy where we could random drug test. And, and there was horror and shock, not from the students, uh, but from some outside people. But it, it has worked particularly well. The student executive are fully uh, supported of us in our residential facility. And we've got 150 50 students. Around the issue of support and communication, all our students do a podcast before they arrive. They've got to get the answers right as far as sexual harassment, bullying and these sort of things. Our student counsellor is involved in induction, but she's also there to meet with especially female students in groups and individually over, over that period. All of our staff have completed the two-day mental health training and we've updated policies, procedures. But the really interesting thing, and number three, was education. Um, and I visited Geelong Grammar, I spoke to the staff there about their, their well-being and also worked with um, some academics from the Faculty of um, Health and Behavioural Science at Deakin University. And we actually developed our own curriculum around wellbeing so that every student that comes to our institution has to complete a unit in each year level over their time with us. And what we've endeavoured to do is two things. First is to make our student experience better than it is but just as importantly, when our students go back out into rural communities as leaders, that, that they're at the forefront. So in first year, it's about the sexual harassment and all those things I've just briefly addressed. The final year is, you're a leader out in those rural communities. How do you handle um, bullying? How do you handle youth suicide? How do you handle depression? And so I employed a, a psychologist who has a strong rural background, and we've been doing that for about four years. So just in summary, what are the results at this stage? Uh, through SurveyMonkey, all our students give us feedback on the residential campus, and that is uh, in improving in increments. 40% uh, of our students are, are female, uh, which is quite high for an agricultural institution. Our, st our student counsellor is giving me and management good feedback about girls and how they feel in that environment, but it's not only girls, there's male students involved in bullying and other things, but the, the last bit that I really liked this year was students organised a student parent dinner, they raised $18,000 and they gave it to the Dolly's Dream Foundation, and for those of you that know that foundation, it's to stop bullying and, uh, and youth suicide. So the message that I got about leadership is getting students involved, endeavouring to work on that culture, and it will take time, but um, we are getting some results. Great. Thank you. Um, I should tell a bit of my own, own story, and I, I want to pick up on uh, something uh, Joanne said about the value of humility. Um, when I uh, got my current role as Vice-Chancellor, uh, I was 39 years old. I was appointed to Australia's first uh, university specialisation, so there weren't any role models out there to use from. And worst of all, I had a history degree, not a theology degree. So I had to ask the question, what did I know uh, that the institution saw in me when I was going to be working with a large number of theology professors? And the reflection I, I took away from that experience uh, was, yes, the need to be humble, um, but also to recognise that wisdom comes in many forms. Uh, so, so one of the uh, odd things I had to deal with was a, a you know, 3,000 years worth of wisdom from the Judeo-Christian tradition in the particular realm of theology that had been brought successfully um, through my institution for 100 years to train um, priests, ministers, religious and pastoral workers. 
And I thought, okay, so I need to listen, learn and, and, and watch uh, and then act. But the thing that's become apparent to me, particularly in the last three or four years, uh, has been a key quality of leadership is courage. So through all of that uh, humility, listening and learning, um, the, the thing that I found really challenging uh, in our institution has been the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Uh, how do you respond as an academic leader when you know that amongst your staff, graduates and students are victims and survivors of child sexual abuse and indeed perpetra perpetrators and bystanders? And you're suddenly faced with the challenge that you need to stand up uh, to call a community to action to say, we need to re-examine our academic programs, re-examine our culture in many of the ways Simon was talking about and say, what is it that we need to change uh, in order to make it a safer place um, for the community, um, for our religious workers, for our graduates? And of course that change very often is around, is around culture. Um, so the wisdom is there, helping people stand up to the integrity of our values um, is the need and, and the courage to change that culture uh, is enormous and, and I guess my observation has been one of the ways to be courageous is in fact to be humble but to be persistent. Um, so I'd say courage, humility and persistence um, are the values I would like to put there. We've got a really good question uh, on the screen, um, a couple of questions that are relating to the issue of how do you form uh, new leaders and I think in a fast changing world um, this is a huge question. Some of, the, some of the older ways perhaps of training up people who are academic experts, who then step, if you like, into the boardroom or the executive roles is one way. Um, but one of the questions here is that many of the characteristics jo Joanne and other panellists have identified are seen to be innate. Uh, how do you teach someone to be wise or humble or courageous? Um, how do you teach someone to be good at these skills? And I just invite the panel to comment perhaps, um, what, what can we do to train a new generation of leaders? So, let me say first of all that I would accept that there are leaders who are very intuitive. The one that springs to mind for me is Richard Branston, but there probably actually isn't that many who are completely intuitive. You know, if you looked at someone like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, you know, they might have come across as the charismatic but you bet your bottom dollar, they knew who their teams were, they knew where there were gaps in their teams, and they knew the young people to pick and, 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 and bring through. So I do think you can um, improve and teach people leadership skills about identifying, for example, teams where the gaps are, the importance of diversity on team. If you had a team where every single person was an alpha male, you would fail. And you would probably have failed before you even noticed it. So, you know, you can tra train people to look for this and that, identify a gap in their team, and that's probably where the innovation is. I mean, we need to have um, uh, people who can identify the characteristics of online learners, the needs of online learners, for example, and indeed the needs of our diverse student body. So I don't think it is all innate. Mm. I, I, th I, th I, th I think that's a, um, a really good question. I've spent all of my life in leadership development, so I should have a really quick, snappy answer. And, and I don't think it is quick and snappy. The question, are, are you born or are you made a leader? Some people, I think, it come more naturally to them. Uh, but I think about leaders like Hitler, who was very charismatic and had huge followership. You know, if leadership is about followership and taking people with you. So, so what is it that makes a leader? And there's a question here about how do we develop leaders, particularly when our communities are so far flung and due to a range of things. And I think it goes back to that, that values, you know, leading through values, being clear about the values that are important to you. Um, and, and in terms of building teams, um, as you say, valuing the diversity, but understanding it. So the number of times I've worked with within universities and I've been told this is a dysfunctional group, Alison, but you go in and sort them out. They're not dysfunctional, they need clarity of task. They need to understand, um, this is what they tell me, I didn't know this before, they sort of, you know, people are different, they bring different things to the party. So there's a whole body of stuff which will help us. I think it's about how you facilitate what's right in that particular circumstance, but it's a lifelong journey. 
I'm still learning. You know, it's, it's a lifelong journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it's actually a really interesting question because it's one, oopsie daisy, once again. <laughs> Apparently every time I present I say that. Um, it's, it's a really interesting question because it's something that we're actually really talking about a lot in Indigenous studies and Indigenous academia. Because currently, uh, because of the funding um, allotments, every um, institution now needs an Indigenous leadership position. So you have some institutions that already have them, some that have implemented, some that need, still need to. And so we're thinking, well, what does make a leader? What makes a really good leader? What makes a leader for that particular institution to really um, foster Indigenous growth within the institution, but foster Indigenous student retention and, and completions? Um, and I think that it is that we need to step out of the box of what makes a traditional. We don't necessarily need the A to B to C to D to E to um, academic anymore. We need somebody that's actually going to be innovative and think and really play to our strengths in 2018 and onwards. And I think that is, that's that person that may not actually come from academia themselves. We have vice chancellors in Australia that haven't finished undergraduate degrees. Um, and they're probably some of the most engaging vice chancellors there are. So why does, some, why does somebody have to come from in that box? And I think we need to step outside of that box and we need to look at, well, who makes the person, who makes the individual, and do they suit that particular institution? Because that individual will make that institution 10 times better because of who they are, not necessarily the qualifications they come with. Just quickly, I think every institution that you, you or uh, provider that you visit, before you meet the vice chancellor or the principal or the CEO, you've got a sense of how well that, and I'll say business, is run. How do the grounds look, the maintenance, the staff that you talk to, the students, are they happy? And as you move around and you think about it, the institutions you've visited, you've got a snapshot of whether they're well run or not. Now, is that leadership or management? My view, it's both. And the CEO uh, or vice chancellor needs to be uh, a business manager. It doesn't mean that they have to be all about financial efficiency and so forth. They need to have the vision and then they need that support there about how they're actually gonna get that vision uh, implemented. We've got quite a few questions um, up here on, on the screen around uh, TEXA risk factors around academic leadership. And uh, none of us are capable of speaking on behalf of TEXA. But I, I wonder if we might pick up on a couple of those issues. Um, I guess my view around academic leadership would be to say, if the institution isn't showing leaders who are willing to take risks, then it has a significant uh, risk. Uh, sitting in front of it. And so one of the queries is, what does leadership look like in an academic context that can demonstrate appropriate risk taking and innovation? I think curriculum and so forth, we've got to be uh, driven in some ways by industry. At the end of the day, we're looking at uh, young people coming through a tertiary institution to forge their career, whether it be in, in, um, uh, in business or in jobs or, or, or whatever. And so I think, uh, the institution needs to work back from that. And, and I don't think that necessarily roadblocks need to come up as far as um, education development and so forth. Um, but certainly it's picking some of the, the best thought leaders that you can get involved into um, your institution. Mm. Uh, can, I, can I just say, I mean, I've worked in higher education for nearly 30 years and I work for the regulator Hefke in the UK. And I would say traditionally higher education institutions are generally quite low risk. Yeah. Um, so if you want more risk, you've got to have that culture of forgiveness. Um, and there are lots of questions about culture and, and, and what, what do you do about developing culture. That is the core thing. And every vice chancellor I speak to, you know, you know strategies, do the strategy, that's fine. De delivering the strategy, that's the real challenge. We need help with culture. And I don't know if that's the same here, but that's the big issue back at home, culture change, whether it's for student outcomes, whether it's for innovation, whether it's for, well, for a whole range of university broad missions. Yeah, and my staff would certainly say that's what I'm talking about all the time now, yeah. this culture. And that's where the yeah. wisdom comes in, very Absolutely. handy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And maybe finally, Joanne. So I think, um, look, I have worked in two institutions where I've kind of had to help pick up after fairly catastrophic failures of academic leadership, actually. So, you know, I, I, I think that's important. I think where you balance the risk 
and where you try to check as best you can against the possibility of bad leadership is good governance. Mm. And that's where you bring in uh, the, the, the governing bodies. Great. Well, thank you. We've had a fantastic uh, panel today, and I think there are a number of issues there for us to think around, around wisdom and, and culture, but particularly that balance between, I think, risk-taking and good governance and keeping the business running. So, so thank you. Um, Peter, just before you go, I, did, I wanted to, there's a, been a great meme going around social media this week about women's leadership training, of all things. Um, and perfectly pertinent to this session. And what it's saying is that, you know, um, obviously women's leadership training has some implications because it tends to single women out as lacking leadership and being able to somehow acquire a set of, um, you know, attributes mm -hmm. that will somehow make them a better leader through this training. And the suggestion is that perhaps rather than having women's leadership training or every single time someone, a higher education provider, launches another women's leadership training course, there should also be male modesty training. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, thank you very much, everyone, for your contributions today.